If you know Jen Gomel, she is almost always smiling. But she was smiling bigger holding that uh, t-shirt bazooka there at the end, I think. Um, and we are looking forward to uh, the stadium service next week. And I got to say, it's just good to be with all of you. Um, it has been about a year since we launched the Mill Creek service, uh, the Mill Creek campus. And as you know, I've been over there most every Sunday uh, with that community, um, which means I haven't had the opportunity to be here with all of you. And so this is just a joy for me. Um, to, be, to see so many familiar faces and to uh, worship with you all this morning. Uh, we are coming up to the conclusion of our summer series, our summer study on the book of James. We're going to read this last section that James writes, and it's on the topic of, of prayer. And I think of prayer, I have a tendency to think of prayer a little bit like I think of Ikea furniture. That is, has anybody ever, have you ever bought furniture from Ikea? Anybody here? A few of you have? Yeah. It, it, the promise of Ikea furniture, first of all, I, I am a, a woodworker by hobby. So woodworkers just hate Ikea to begin with. It's just, there's something about it that just doesn't feel right. But every once in a while, my wife will be like, I don't have three and a half years to wait for you to build a bookshelf, so we're going to go get something. And, and I'll reluctantly go with her. And the promise is, is simplicity, right? It, it's that this is going to be this uh, desk that's put together, and somehow it comes in this really flat box, but, but it's all simple for you to do. And you open it up, and there's like 1,800 parts in there, and then the instructions is a single sheet of paper with three pictures and no words, right? <laughs> and you're wondering, what am I supposed to do with all of this? See, the promise is so simple. It, it seems so straightforward. I think we'll discover that when we're reading James about prayer. And yet oftentimes our experience of that, our, our, our practice of that feels complicated. Maybe you can relate. As we wrap up this, this letter, this incredibly powerful, direct, action-oriented letter that James has written to the church, James describes, he says, life for the Christian is to be lived out of our faith in Jesus. So our faith in Jesus is core, and, and how we live our lives emanate out of that. There's no room, then, for James uh, for the compartmentalized life, where, where I have given God authority and rule and reign in my life in these areas, and, and I say, okay, you are king, and I surrender. But in these other areas of life, I say, you know, I'd really like to kind of keep hold of the reins here. I'd, I, I would like to be the one in charge. Those are um, not reconcilable in James' view of life when we've surrendered to Jesus and responded to the gospel. It's not an option that is available to us. James, according uh, uh, to the letter that we've read together, says Christ is life, and, and life is to be lived in Christ. They cannot be, must not be separated in the life of the Christian. So now as James is finishing this letter to the church, James once again will, will become extremely practical. He addresses this community of people who as a result of their suffering have looked to their pastor and they're asking him, what is it that we're supposed to do? And James instructs them and says, you should pray. You should pray. It seems so simple. The, the promises of James seem so straightforward. And yet oftentimes the experience of prayer, well, all of that feels a lot more complicated. So let's, let's turn to James chapter 5 where he is going to address some of these issues. And again, this is the, the conclusion of the letter. And I'm going to start in verse 13 and then read through the end of the chapter together. James writes, he says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wonder from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from their air, the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of, of ways that we could approach James' verses, this text, on prayer this morning. And that would be valid and worth us doing. But for our time together, I, I simply want to look at and consider three qualities of prayer that James describes here. Beginning with the reality that prayer is relational. Prayer is intended to be relational. I oftentimes say, and, and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian as well, that as we're coming to a, a conclusion of a letter, when we're in these New Testament studies of the epistles or Hebrews or Ephesians like we did last year, it's important to note how the author wraps up. Because oftentimes these concluding remarks that the author is making reveal something about how we can apply everything that's been taught throughout their letter. There's a, there's a special point of, of emphasis here. And I think James is, is no different. James has been describing to us throughout this letter what a genuine saving faith looks like when it's put into action. And James, as he's finishing up here, in this letter, he helps us understand that this, what he's described to us is only possible, this life of obedience, when we are experiencing intimate community with God. So again, let me, let me be clear here. The, the life of obedience that James has described to us, particularly obedience in the face of, of difficulty and pain and trial, it is only possible if it is rooted in a deep, personal relational time spent with God. And James is saying that this is what prayer affords you. This is what prayer provides for you. It's relational time with God. So he writes and says, are, are you in trouble? Then, then spend time with God. You should pray. You should communion with, uh, commune with him. You should enter into his presence. Are, are, are you happy? Then James says, sing songs of praise which is a prayer in and of itself. You should spend time in his presence thanking him for the, com uh, the contentment that he's provided for you. So James is telling us that these, these things should be normative in the life of the church, in the life of the Christian. James writes and says, are you sick? It's interesting to note that the word that James uses here that is translated sick not only includes physical illness, but, but is more than that. It refers to weakness of any kind, so that emotional or mental or spiritual weakness in our life. This is the same word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he talks about his thorn in the flesh. And how he talks and describes and he says he boasts in his weakness because in, its weak, in his weakness, Christ's power is resting on him, it's that same word. So James says when you're weak, when you're sick, in the midst of your brokenness, call the elders of the church together. Surround yourself with spiritually mature men and women to pray over you, to anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Spend time together in prayer in his presence. Spend time seeking him in the midst of your weakness so that he will be your strength. See, so James helps us understand that this life of obedience that the church is called to is, is dependent upon our dependence on him. And our dependence on him drives us into his presence. That's what, that's what prayer provides for us. Prayer is relational time spent with him. One of the clearest pictures of this that, that I've had in my life came... Um, about 11 years ago, well, no, about 10 years ago, when my youngest daughter, Naomi, was just nine weeks old. Some of you will remember this. I was relatively new here at the church, maybe about a year, 
when she was diagnosed or, or contracted RSV, which in most kids is, is something akin to the common cold, but in a nine-week-old can not only be dangerous, it can even, in fact, be deadly. And so she was in the pediatric ICU at, at CDH Hospital and struggling. She was so congested and so backed up that her oxygen levels were dropping pretty significantly. And at one point in time during the week, the doctors came to us and said, parents, uh, to us as her parents and said, you know, these next 24 hours, these, these are going to be critical for her. Um, and I just remember all of the, the fear in that moment. And the thing that, that I remember was that Naomi, um, when she was laying in this tiny little crib, if, if her mom or I were talking to the doctor, well, hey, she would just get so agitated and, and frustrated and try to remove her mask and just was um, upset. And so Sherry and I would stay by her crib, and, and if she just had her tiny little hand wrapped around one of our pinkies, she felt at ease. She felt like things were, were okay, and she would rest and be calm and, and comfortable. And so Sherry and I took rotations throughout the entire night, just one of us sitting by her crib, letting her cling to, to our pinky. And I remember being there in the middle of the night and just being in this kind of desperate stage of prayer where, where I'm scared and I'm um, unnerved by everything that is going on around me. And I'm worried for my, my little one and anxiety is just overwhelming me. And she's clinging to my pinky. And this image just sort of burned into my memory of as my little baby daughter is holding on to me, just my, my arm raised up and sort of, if you will, clinging to the pinky of God because that's all I could do in that moment. And, and, and God just sort of burned that image in my head to sit in his presence as Naomi sat in mine, to be there in that moment. And, 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 and this idea of this is how life is meant to be lived with one arm out to the world around us and what's going on in our circumstances and our situation, and one arm up that just clings to the presence of God. And James says this is what drives, this is what makes the life of obedience, of following Christ in every circumstance, this is what makes it possible. This, this instruction to pray here in James chapter 5 is an invitation. It's an invitation into his presence. So what do we do when we're suffering? What, what do we do in the midst of, of joy and commitment? What do we do when we are face to face with our weakness? James tells us to pray, to enter into relational time with the sovereign God who loves us and, and who allows us into his presence so that it can empower our, our response of faithfulness to him. By the way, what, what I think James is describing to us here is, is, is a regular, consistent sort of habitual practice of entering into his presence, no matter what season of life we find ourselves in. James invites you, he instructs you to live out of the time that you've spent in his presence. And so he teaches us that this is what prayer accomplishes for us. So James says that prayer is relational. He goes on then to describe the second quality of prayer, and that is prayer is restorative. Prayer is restorative. Um, many years ago, when I was a young youth pastor, I was blind as a bat. Um, I wore contacts and glasses all the time, and, and I remember being um, in retreats with students. I'd take my contacts out, and I'd be laying in my bed, and if you've ever been on one of those retreats, you know that's sometimes when the kids get moving, and I would hear stuff going on around me, and I couldn't tell who was doing what. And I would just be like, I don't know who you are, but shut up and go to bed. You know, like yell out these vague sort of things. And I couldn't see anything. And, and somebody uh, told me about this doctor who actually was in the, my hometown in Ohio and said for people in full-time ministry, they would offer free LASIK eye surgery. Um, it sounded too good to be true. And, and so I, I called the doctor's office and he said, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. It's my, my ministry to people in ministry and so he said, it's just a matter of getting you on the list. And he scheduled an appointment. It was about six months out. And my wife and I um, showed up and, and were excited and, and, and waiting. And just to give you an idea of, of kind of my state prior to the surgery, my wife went back into the exam with me. 
And when I took off my glasses, well, they, they had the eye chart up there, and it had all those little lines with all the letters and that sort of thing. And they put that up there. I took off my glasses, and they switched the chart to where it was just one letter. And, and they go, well, what do you see? And I assumed it was still all the little letters. And, and I said, oh, I can't see those. Like, that is, and my wife looks at me, and she goes, it's just the big E. Like, <laughs> you should know that one by memory. Like, uh, and I remember in that moment wondering to myself, what will it be like to see clearly again? What, what is it going to be like for my eyes to operate the way they were designed to operate? Look what, look what James tells us here. This is verse 15. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. You see, James describes the work of prayer as restorative of it. Now, now these are bold words that James says here. He says, a prayer offered in faith, one, will make the sick person well, and two, if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Th those are incredible promises that James is making. So, so what are we to make of this? Is this a promise that a prayer for physical healing will be effective if we have enough faith? And how do we understand this in light of, of situations where God's people have gathered together to earnestly, genuinely seek him for for the healing of someone that we love, only to have that prayer go unanswered, or at least to go unanswered in the way that, that James seems to describe here. And this isn't, this isn't theoretical for me. I, I, I've wrestled with this, to understand this, because there's been times in my life when I have desperately and earnestly sought God on behalf of someone that I care deeply about. Only to see that prayer um, go unresolved, again, at least in the way that, that James seems to teach us here. So how do we understand James' promise in view of our experiences? Is it simply that, that I must not have had enough faith? See, this is what I meant earlier when I said that, that the promise seems so simple and so clear, and yet the experience oftentimes is, is, is much more complicated. First, I, I think it's important for us to understand that, that the, the cultural understanding of illness at this time that James is writing is that we experience illness in our life as a result of sin. We talked about this last week when we looked earlier in James 5, and James cites the example of Job, and how Job, when, when in the midst of his devastation and calamity, his friends come and surround him, and they say, well, Job, all of this this has to be the result of some type of sin in your life. This has to be the result of something that you've done. But, but we have the larger picture. We see the story that's unfolding, and we see how James, or Job, excuse me, protests that and says he, he declares his innocent. In John chapter 9, you see another example where the disciples come across a man who was born blind. And they asked Jesus the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You, you can see the assumption in their question. His condition is a result of his sin. And Jesus corrects them and says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But what this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, so Jesus nor James are teaching us that illness is the result of some personal sin, and, and we as the church need to be careful not to make that assumption about ourselves or about someone else. However, James also understands that sin affects every area of our lives, including our, 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 our uh, physical, our mental, our emotional, and of course, our spiritual well-being. He understands that, that we are holistic beings, and so when when there is disruption in who we are spiritually, it has ramifications in almost every other area of our life. So James is saying that sin or illness is not necessarily the result of personal sin, but sin can and does make us ill in, in a lot of ways. And this is what James appears to be addressing here. 
By the way, what, what's interesting, and if we had more time in researching this, I came across a couple um, studies in modern psychology that are discovering that this very thing, they're, not, they're approaching this from a secular point of view, but they're essentially validating what James is teaching us here. How when there is, in our lives, the perception they just say wrong, in quotes, because you, I guess you can't call anything wrong these days, or sin, but when they say when that's consistent in their lives, it affects us in all sorts of other areas of our lives, and they're, they're, they're identifying this and seeing this. We, we sometimes have, have experienced this, and, and whether it's personal or you've seen it, but when, when sin has been confronted or, or, or we come to a point where, where we have sought forgiveness and there's, there's this weight that is removed, there, there's not just the spiritual freedom that we feel, yes, we do feel that, there is physical, tangible um, relief that we experience in our life. So James is, and, and this is the good news about what James is telling us here. James is teaching the church that these, these ramifications, these side effects of sin in our lives, they have a solution. And that solution is the prayer offered in faith. It's the, it's the restorative work of God. Look again in verse 16. He says, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful, and it is effective. The restorative work of God, there's the promise of prayer, specifically as it relates to the consequence of sin in our lives. He says, you, you will be healed. I remember Pastor Roger saying all the time, when, when people would ask him about his battle with cancer, and, and his belief, if God would heal him, say, oh, God healed me long ago. I may or may not get better, but God has already healed me. James says, you, you will be healed. The prayer of, of, of God's people speaks power, and it is effective into dealing with our sin. And you will be forgiven. And this is not saying, as the church, when, when somebody is ill, has a physical illness, that we shouldn't bother to gather and pray. We absolutely should do that. And God may or may not heal their physical illness. But he, he will heal and he does restore that which separates us from him. And this is what James wants us to understand, that prayer is restorative. Lastly then, the third quality of prayer that James emphasizes here is that prayer is experienced in community. Prayer is experienced in community. You all know those, those uh, I just sounded like a southerner there for a second. I just went, y'all, yeah. I don't know where that came from. Um, you know uh, those experiences in life where you have a situation where you can do it on your own. It's, it's possible, but it's so much easier and so much more effective when you have people around you, right? And sometimes even our, our pride gets in the way when we should ask for help, but but we don't. I remember, uh, again, when Sherry and I were just starting here at Chapel Street Church, and we lived in Wheaton at the time, and we were getting our house ready to sell. And the realtor came and said, he lists, here's a list of projects that would be great if you could get these things done before we list the house. Um, it's going to sell so much faster and for more money. And, and it was a little overwhelming. And so Keith Duncan, whose daughters at the time were, were in the student ministry here in, at Chapel Street, said, listen, let me, let me gather together a group of people. We'll show up, and, and we'll try to knock these out. And I said, look, Keith, that's, that's great. I appreciate it. You don't have to do that. You're busy. And he, he, he was persistent. And I, I eventually gave in, but I thought, there's no way we're going to get all this done. I had this massive list of things. And Keith, on a Saturday, showed up with a small army of, of men and women and students at my house, including not only, like, some projects inside, but painting a good section of the exterior of my house and had it all done by Saturday afternoon. We were able to list the house that early that next week and it sold five days later. Sometimes things in life are meant to be done in community. We're meant to receive the power of the body around us. Look at James uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? 
Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it is effective. Of course, there are examples that we see in, throughout the Bible where prayer and confession are, are individual and they are, they are personal. Jesus, uh, we're taught, would withdraw to lonely pray, places in order to pray. And he set that as a, as a model for us, that we should do that. So James is not teaching us that, that prayer and confession must always take place in the context of community. With, with other followers of Jesus around us, but he is also is teaching us that our prayer lives and that our acts of confession should include community. It should not be separate from community, and here's why. He says, because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. He's saying that the, the healing that we crave, the freedom from the power of sin, the promise of forgiveness, James tells us, he says, Call the people of God together. Let the elders of the church surround you. Have them pray over you. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. This is, there's something powerful and effective about gathering the body of Christ around you, about acknowledging the struggle, confessing sin, receiving their prayers on your behalf, and experiencing the healing that James promises us here. And even as I say this, I, I, I know that for many of us right now in our heart of hearts, we're hearing this and we're saying, I'm not doing that. I don't, I don't want to do that. This is a, a private matter, or this is between me and God, or there's too much shame or, or guilt or embarrassment involved for me to, to bring this out into the open or to confess this to somebody or to ask them to pray over me and my sin. And I know that in, we're struggling with this, or at least I'm guessing, because that's what my heart is saying. My, my heart is saying, I don't want to do that. Uh, I, I don't want somebody to see that side of me. I don't, I don't want to have to acknowledge that element of my weakness and so even when we do sometimes confess and open up I, I do it in ways that are safe I do it in ways that that I feel like will be protected and so I'll say hey pray for me I uh, um, you know I, I really struggled with generosity this week or something because I feel like okay I can confess that and maybe they're not going to be too hard on me but some of those deep dark areas of my life I'm, I'm going to keep that protected and, and I'm going to just sort of talk to God about that and I should but I should also talk to you and we fight that because we, we feel like um, there's too much shame or embarrassment or we don't know um, how people will respond but here's what I want you to hear today what James is teaching us is that it's the confessed sin, the sin that is confessed in community that loses its power on us. See, shame and guilt thrive in isolation. They, they thrive in hiding, but when they are exposed to the light, they cannot survive. They cannot live there. Look what John writes in, in 1 John chapter 1, just a few pages back. He describes it this way. This is verse 5 and following. He says, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, this is, this is the promise that, that 
John is alluding to or, not, or teaching us on here that James is making at the end of his letter. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor and theologian and part of the resistance, German resistance against uh, Hitler and the Nazis during World War II. He was eventually imprisoned and ultimately executed as a result of, of his participation in the resistance. But he wrote a small book entitled Life Together. And in that book, the last chapter, I believe it's the very last chapter, talks about and addresses the practice of prayer and confession in the context of community. That, that single chapter in that tiny little book is one of the most powerful things outside of Scripture I have ever read in my Christian life. Because I think it helped me understand and convinced me that what James tells us here is true. It, it helped me take the risk of bringing people around me, and instead of just sort of in the safety of, of how I would like to kind of confess, just sort of open up my heart and say, hey, here's the real me, and, and I need you guys to pray into this. And one of the things that, that Bonhoeffer points out in that book that, that he says is so powerful about that experience is that when we confess our sins in the context of community, and there is a brother or sister in Christ who is sitting across the table who is able to receive that and look me in the eyes and say, Sterling, there's, there's grace for that. Sterling, there, the, Christ died for that. Sterling, know that you have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. When there's the tangible, audible expression of God's grace into sin, sin cannot survive and it loses its grip of power in us. So it says, James says, confess one to another. It's one of the greatest gifts that you'll ever receive. James writes and says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. They will, the Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, their sins will be forgiven. We're going to conclude this morning with a response of worship, as we often do. But following that time, our prayer team will be available, as they are each and every Sunday. And my encouragement to you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking into your life, I know sometimes the, 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 the response of walking up forward when everyone else is walking out feels like a bridge too far. But I want to encourage you as the church to surround yourself with brothers and sisters in Jesus and to enter into the presence of God. To allow him in community to speak into your life, to deal with our sin, to heal our bodies. This is what James has promised to us. This is what we have available to us in Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you again for this incredible letter that we've studied this summer. Lord, a letter that has challenged us and pushed us and, and, and presented this um, case of what obedience to you looks like no matter what the circumstances are. And God, we've wrestled through and tried to understand. And yet we discover as, as James wraps up this letter, he's saying that the only way that this is possible is if we are experiencing the empowering work of your presence in our lives. So God, let us be people of prayer that regularly and consistently enter into your presence and may we live out our faith in you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.